All right. Good morning, everybody. My name is Shalini Wickramathilica. I'm the Associate Director of Intergovernmental Affairs at ONDCP. Thank you all so much for joining us today for our event focused on removing barriers to addiction treatment. It's good to see so many of you here in person, and we're also grateful to those of you tuned in via the live stream. We have a packed agenda for you this morning, so we'll go ahead and get started. And it's my honor to introduce our first speaker, the Director of the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy, Dr. Rahul Gupta. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Shalini, and, and welcome to the White House. You know, in his State of the Union address, President Biden called on Congress to act to remove barriers that prevent doctors from treating their patients with addiction. And today, we're here to recognize the legislation to remove those barriers to addiction treatment and your relentless efforts to make this historic action possible. At a time when our nation has experienced 107,000 drug overdose and poisonings in just one year's time, this change could not have come sooner. Now, just about every person in this room and watching online knows or has known someone with an opioid use disorder. And for far too many, help for their addiction did not come soon enough. As a physician who's been treating patients with substance use disorder for more than 20 years, I've known that myself. I'll share an example, and you know, I'll call the patient Billy, and I wrote about it in USA Today, just yesterday online that was published. You know, this was one of my formative experiences when I went to start a clinical practice in a rural town in Alabama. I met Billy, and it was a nice town of 1,800 people just above the Florida Panhandle, close to the beach. It's on Highway 331, and he was one of my first patients there. I discovered that he had been receiving pain medications from various physicians and providers over the years, oftentimes multiple. And I diagnosed him with opioid use disorder. But I couldn't help him, at least not directly. As everyone here knows, that regulation at the time allowed me to prescribe an addiction category of opioid for pain to my patients. But they preventing me from treating Billy for opioid addiction without getting an X waiver license. And frankly, I was busy starting up and running a private practice in a very rural town. So I had to refer him to a specialist almost 100 miles away. You know, Billy provided for his family for working at a small business in town on a minimum wage. But my referral meant that he'd need to take time off work He'd need to spend money on gas to get there. And guess what? He never made it to the specialist. Instead, he started buying illicit drugs on the street when I cut him off. And that day when I was called to the ER to take care, Billy died in my hands. And the story has played out all across America time and time and time again. And that's what brings us all together here today. You know, last month, with the stroke of his pen, President Biden expanded access to treatment for opioid use disorder to millions of Americans when he signed the bipartisan omnibus government funding bill into law. Now, in his national drug control strategy, President Biden called for making access to treatment for substance use disorder universal by 2025. Our approach is guided by science and data and evidence. So we know that buprenorphine works for opioid use disorder. We've known this for many years. Some have opposed making this treatment more readily available because of potential diversion. 
But just last week, NIH and CDC released a study showing that telehealth treatment with BUP during the pandemic did not, did not lead to more overdose deaths. So that's great news, and it's further proof that we're on the right track. And the administration is working hard to make permanent two of these key COVID era flexibilities, including buprenorphine induction through telehealth and take home medications. And I'll thank my partners for doing that. And as a result of these efforts across the public health and public safety, we're already seeing results. We've now had five straight months, five straight months where overdose numbers have decreased. It's two and a half percent drop. But what it really means in lives is about 2,800 people who are not dying each year. Now, it's a hopeful sign, but it's not enough. We've got a long way to go. And because this bill and other actions by the Biden-Harris administration, healthcare providers across the nation can help us get there. They can do this by signing, beginning to treat addiction, a disease of the brain, just as they treat diabetes or heart disease or emphysema. And this is a game changer. I'll tell you the nature of this is a huge game changer. And it's a perfect example that what we can achieve when we work together. Folks, this is a bipartisan achievement. Some of the bill sponsors are here today, and I want to recognize them. Representative Tonko of New York and Senator Hassan of New Hampshire. <laughs> You've been champions from day one, and it's your leadership and, and, and looking out for Americans that has resulted in us being here today to make sure we're moving forward. And while Senator Lisa Murkowski of Alaska and Representative Turner of Ohio couldn't make it, we give our thanks to them as well. You know, as President Biden said after Congress passed this bill, this bill is further proof that Republicans and Democrats can come together to deliver for the American people. Addiction is not a red state problem or a blue state problem. It's America's problem. And we all have to work together to solve this problem. I want to thank every member of Congress, the parents, the loved ones, the advocates who fought for this bill's passage. I want to thank specifically also within government department of justice, Administrator Milgram for your leadership at the Drug Enforcement Administration. I want to thank Health and Human Services and Assistant Secretary Delphin Rittman for your leadership and SAMHSA as, um, uh, for their shared vision and collaboration in promoting this critical policy change. I would also like to thank my White House colleagues for their strong and unwavering support for this bill. And I want to especially thank my former legislative director, Ann Sakalaw, who's here for all her work with members and their staff. Thank you all. It's turning red already. <laughs> I also want like to thank everyone at ONCP who has worked so hard for so many years for this policy change that will literally save lives, and of course the MAT Act Coalition and all of the other groups who advocated for the MAT Act. <laughs> There's so many nonprofit organizations, partners, and those in the medical field, parents and those with lost loved ones. Folks, this was a team effort every step of the way. Think about it. This bill does not get introduced into Congress without strong support from families and organizations. Congress doesn't pass this bill without strong support from representatives and others, and, and senators. And the President Biden doesn't sign this bill without the support of everyone in this room. So thank you so much to all of you. 
and because everyone on this team fought for the MAD Act and fought for making sure that treatment is accessible, this bill is law of the land today. Thank you. Now, this is a testament to all of you, the advocates, the policymakers, the families who turned their grief into action to get the job done. So thank you, everyone, for your tireless work. And let's give everyone here and online a final round of applause. <laughs> now, I want to move to talking about a little bit about, you know, people with opioid use disorders who will finally be able to access treatment that they need and to the memory of everyone who died from the opioid use disorder without getting this treatment. And while we pause here to recognize the achievement today, we know that there's more work to be done. We've got to implement the law. And we've got to ensure that pharmaceutical companies, the distributors, the pharmacies are making treatment available, accessible, and affordable. We've got to make sure that providers and patients know that they have more options for treatment. So to my colleagues in the medical field, now is the time to join in treating patients with addiction. I'm a primary care physician. And when I began first seeing patients with addiction, I thought, you know, treating them was a job of addiction doctors. But then I realized that my patient needed me to step up, so I went and got the X waiver. And now thanks to this law that you can, so many of you can do the same thing without getting the X waiver. Our nation and your patients need you to do this. Today we'll hear from several people who were instrumental in making this happen and is going to be working to implement this new policy. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Miriam Delphin Rittman, our Assistant Secretary of SAPS. Good morning, everyone. So I want to say thank you, you know, Dr. Gupta, for that introduction, also for your leadership and your commitment uh, to addressing overdose uh, across the nation. Uh, Administrator Milgram and Dr. Martin. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you, as well as everyone who's joining us here in the room, as well as uh, who's joining us online. Um, I want to begin by saying a special thank you to Senator Hassan, uh, Representative Tonko, uh, and members of Congress who were central uh, in passing uh, this really historic legislation. Uh, and as Dr. Gupta mentioned, uh, this is something that took a village. Uh, and so I thank everybody that worked on this. It truly was uh, a, a, an effort that took many different sectors of the community, of families, individuals in recovery across the behavioral health field. Um, and so I thank everyone who's helped us get to this moment, as Dr. Gupta had mentioned. Um, this collaborative work, we know it significantly expands access uh, to medication for treating opioid use disorder, and that is so important. Um, importantly, it removes the need to obtain a waiver prescribe buprenorphine. Um, it also removes limits on the numbers of individuals a physician or a prescriber can work with, and we know that's important as well. Um, these are critical steps, critical steps in our shared goal ultimately of saving lives. Um, this work ultimately is about saving lives. Um, and given the urgency of the nation's addiction and overdose crisis, having providers trained uh, and willing to prescribe uh, medication for opioid use disorder is, is vitally critical and cannot be overstated. Um, we know that unfortunately overdose remains one of the leading causes of injury death across the country. Um, CDC data, as Dr. Gupta mentioned, over 107,000 uh, individuals died of an overdose in 2022. And in addition to that, uh, SAMHSA's most recent uh, national survey on drug use and health estimates that about 46 million, 46.3 million Americans uh, 12 or older, or 16.5% of the population, um, met criteria for having a substance use disorder. Um, and, and so these numbers are heartbreaking. They're heartbreaking. Um, they represent our loved ones, our family members, our coworkers, our friends, our neighbors, our children. Uh, and adding complexity uh, to the crisis, we know that diverse and vulnerable populations uh, are disproportionately impacted by substance use disorder. 
So the removal of the, the waiver will go a long way. It will go a long way towards meeting people with opioid use disorder where they are uh, in their recovery journeys. However, we know that there is more work to do. SAMHSA, we will continue to work to address the overdose crisis, implementing the HHS overdose prevention strategy and the President's unity agenda. We will continue our collaborative work with all of you to break down barriers, to reduce stigma, and to expand access for every individual that needs behavioral health services and behavioral health care, regardless of where they live, who they are, or their ability to pay. Um, we encourage all eligible in, uh, prescribers and practitioners to screen for opioid use disorders and to offer buprenorphine for individuals that may be struggling. We want individuals to know that treatment is available, that treatment is effective, uh, and that recovery is possible. So again, thank you everyone for being here. Uh, and now it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, the Drug Enforcement Administrator, Administration Administrator, uh, Ann Milgram. So thank you. Thank you so much. Good morning. Every morning when I walk into DEA headquarters in Arlington, Virginia, I walk past our walls that are now covered by the faces of fentanyl. Last June, we had a number of families who'd lost loved ones to fentanyl poisoning, and we invited them to our headquarters. Before they came, we asked if anyone would like to share with us a photograph of their loved one. We expected to get about 30 or 40 photographs, and we did in that first week. Today, there are more than 4,800 faces of Americans who have died to fentanyl poisoning that line the walls of DEA. It has become a memorial where families come now from across the country to put up photos of their loved ones, and it is also a call to action. It is a call to action for the men and women of DEA that our mission right now is to do everything we can to save lives and to prevent any other faces from being placed on our wall. It's a call to action for our special agents who are working right now worldwide in more than 300 offices to defeat the two criminal networks, Sinaloa and Jalisco, that are most responsible for the fentanyl and meth that is killing Americans. It's a call to action to save lives when we do public awareness work across the country through family summits and through our One Pill Can Kill initiative. And it's a call to action to save lives when we join together with members of Congress and partners in government to do what has happened here, the elimination of the data waiver. This is a game changer for all of us. One of the faces on our wall, the faces of fentanyl wall, is Tyler Cordero. He's forever 24. Tyler's last night with his mother, they sat at her kitchen table and they shared a pizza. They had spent the prior 24 hours trying to get Tyler into treatment or in to see a doctor who could help him. He lit up every room he walked into. He was the drummer in his marching band and he had suffered from substance use disorder for more than six years and had been in and out of treatment. And the day before his last night, he relapsed and they had called doctor upon doctor and treatment center after treatment center and they could not get him in. After dinner, Tyler went to the corner store to get some things. And when he didn't get back, his mom went out and she saw the police car and the ambulance and she knew Tyler was lost. He died that night from fentanyl poisoning. What happened to Tyler should not happen in the United States of America. It should not happen. And that is why this bill is so powerful and it is such a game changer. We are now going from 130,000 individuals who can prescribe buprenorphine to 1.8 million Americans who can prescribe it. That is in every state in the country, rural, suburban, and urban. It does change the game. And there is more for us to do together, but I stand here absolutely grateful for the work that has been done and the lives that will be saved as a result of it. I want to close by saying that as I stand here, you may hear sadness or anger or frustration in my voice, and that's right. I feel all of those things. 
as I go to work every single day. But that's not what drives me. What drives me is the belief, the knowledge, that working together, we can make access to treatment available to every single American. That working together, the people in this room can solve this problem. And it is such a privilege and an honor to be partnered with all of you in doing that. It's also my privilege to introduce to you a true leader on this issue for many, many years, Senator Maggie Hassan. Senator Hassan has been working on this as a sponsor of the MAD Act, but also as a champion of access to treatment for as long as I can remember. And I'm so grateful for your friendship and your work. Well, good day, everybody. And Administrator Milgram, thank you not only for the introduction, but for your words right just now, for your leadership, and a special thanks to all the men and women at the DEA who you lead. Uh, this is hard and difficult and dangerous work, and we are very, very grateful to all of them. It's also great to be here with Congressman Tonko, my partner in this effort, along with our other uh, co lead co-sponsors. To Dr. Gupta, thank you as well for your leadership and for the team you lead. To Dr. Uh, Delphine Rittman, thank you as well. Uh, this is a team effort. And I'm also looking forward to hearing from Dr. Martin uh, as we talk about the way this partnership can evolve and we can really operationalize and implement uh, this new legislation. It is really an honor to be here today to mark this vital step. Before I go any further, though, I've not yet said the thank you that I think matters the most. A thank you to all the advocates who are here and who are watching this online and who are uh, sprinkled throughout my state of New Hampshire but all over the country who made this day possible. We are here today because of their tenacity. We all know that this has been a long road. The stigma surrounding this crisis has made it far too difficult for people with substance use disorder to get the help and the treatment that they need. And across New Hampshire, we've seen the consequences. Families devastated by unbearable loss and the fabric of our communities forever changed. Forever changed by an illness that does not discriminate, impacting people from all walks of life. But just as New Hampshire knows the horrors of this crisis, so too do we know the importance and value of speaking out, of not being afraid to discuss addiction and recovery with our friends and neighbors, community leaders, and public officials. In doing so, Granite Staters have broken down stigma and changed the way that we are addressing the opioid epidemic. Years ago, when she was only nine years old, a little girl named Jada approached me at a meeting in a church in Plastow, New Hampshire. It was a meeting of families and friends of people in recovery or who had lost people to the epidemic. Jada approached me to tell me about the pain her family was feeling after her beloved cousin died of an opioid overdose. I was really proud of Jada for seeking me out and speaking up but so, so heartbroken that she had to. Heartbroken that at only nine years old, this young girl knew firsthand the pain of this epidemic. Countless other stories have spurred action across New Hampshire. And families who have lost loved ones to the opioid epidemic and people in recovery continue to work tirelessly to try to prevent others from suffering as they have. Their work, and their resilience helped us get to the moment we are at right now, today. As we learn more about opioid use disorder, the necessary steps have never been forward, have never been more clear. Medication-assisted treatment, coupled with counseling, is the most effective treatment for patients who are grappling with opioid use disorder. Yet for too long, federal barriers, barriers rooted in stigma, have impacted access. Up until now, access to one key treatment, prescriptions for buprenorphine, has been severely limited. 
And you can see the toll that these barriers take. Studies have shown that nationwide, 40% of counties lack a single health care provider who can prescribe buprenorphine for opioid use disorder. I recently joined Dr. Seddon Savage from Dartmouth Geisel School of Medicine for a discussion where she emphasized the importance of treating addiction just as we do any other disease. As she said, we treat diabetes with insulin, we treat cardiovascular disease with medication, and so too we can treat opioid use disorder with medication such as buprenorphine. That's why I worked with Senator Murkowski and our partners in the House, including Congressman Tonko, to develop and pass the legislation that we are marking today. For too long, the X waiver blocked highly trained health professionals from prescribing buprenorphine and limited the number of patients that these professionals could prescribe this life medication, life-saving medication to. With the passage and implementation of our law eliminating the X waiver requirement, more patients can access this critical treatment to enter recovery and rebuild their lives. I'm glad that we could come together, listen to the voices of our constituents, and get this law over the finish line. We also know that this is only one part of the comprehensive approach that we need to continue to take to address the opioid epidemic. Breaking the back of this epidemic will continue to require teamwork. Teamwork among healthcare professionals, the recovery community, lawmakers and executives at every single level of government, first responders, and law enforcement. As we do that work, I remain grateful to advocates like Jada and the entire recovery community for the work that they have done and that they continue to do. By standing up and fighting against the stigma of addiction, they've changed the conversation and how we think about treating the epidemic. And at its core, their work is the way we make progress in a democracy. By focusing on each and every person in our democracy, and recognizing their intrinsic worth. So I look forward to continuing to work with all of you to make progress, and it's now my honor to turn the podium over to a real partner in helping get this legislation passed, Congressman Tonko. Well, hello, everyone. What an empowering moment empowering and now offering us to take that power and make it a big difference in the lives of people. It is an honor and indeed just a very humbling moment to be with all of you and the many beyond this room that have made this success possible. So earlier, Dr. Gupta shared the story of Billy. For some of us, we heard about Ethan. It is their story. It is their journey, it is their struggle, and it is their outcome that inspires us to be here today. To the many, many who have been that unfortunate statistic, to the warriors who have shown every bit of courage and resilience and determination, we say thank you for bringing us to this success line. We're gonna make it all work by taking this empowerment and putting the power to those who require it. So I thank my good friend, Senator Hassan. Thank you so much, Senator. We wouldn't be here today without your strong leadership. Thank you for identifying with the struggles of so many. Thank you for agreeing to partner with me on the MAD Act and for all your leadership on addiction issues. As I look around this room, I see many friends, friends who have been on this journey with all of us together. I'm so happy to be here today with each and every one of you. Over the last decade, I've focused my advocacy in Congress on knocking out every single barrier to addiction treatment so that when an individual struggling with the disease of addiction reaches out for help, we have a medical system ready and willing to welcome them with open arms. This is not a journey that any of us undertook lightly. As I have worked on these issues and connected with fellow advocates like so many of you in this room today, all too often it is tragedy that has led us into this line of work. The loss of a daughter, a son, a father, a mother, a sister or a brother, a deeply rooted friendship, a neighbor dying much too young and leaving behind a grieving family, 
communities being ripped apart by poisons seemingly beyond, beyond their control. That is what drives us. This is how we measure our success in lives saved, in families kept whole, and in communities healed. We have opportunity, great opportunity, to respond to struggle. Let this instruct us with every bit of soulfulness. Today's celebration, both a culmination of a long journey, is also the beginning of a new one. As many of you know, I had the distinct privilege of authoring the Mainstreaming Addiction Treatment Act. You guided me through this process, and for that I am forever grateful. Every step of the way, you instructed us. When we first introduced the MAD Act after some initial legislative success on addressing data waiver issues, it is fair to say that we had an uphill battle, a battle that was lying ahead of us. But when the opponents talked about government-sponsored addiction and the naysayers said we were dreaming too big, we all stood together. You stood by my side, pushed this forward, and refused to take no for an answer. You brought data to the fight that helped us make this case, showing that evidence-based and science-based policy make certain that we have a future for all of the people of this country coming right here at, in D.C. You knocked door on doors, you wrote letters, and made a lot of noise. As my good friend, the late Congressman John Lewis would say, we all did it together by making good trouble. Together, we built a strong bipartisan coalition supported by advocates across the nation, including family members who lost loved ones, individuals who faced the disease of addiction, doctors, nurses, physician assistants, pharmacists, AGs, law enforcement, fire chiefs, emergency physicians, district attorneys, addiction specialists, faith leaders, and healthcare addiction, harm reduction, mental health and justice advocates of every stripe. Working hand in hand, we told every member of Congress how federal law made it easier to prescribe potentially addictive opioids than to treat someone with opioid use disorder. I need to repeat that. Federal law made it easier to prescribe potentially addictive opioids than to treat someone with opioid use disorder. Well, that has come to a turn in the road. And for some, we told them over and over and over again. Slowly but surely, we will win the hearts and minds and build strong and deep support. I'm forever grateful for everyone who helped get this life-saving bill signed into law. Senator Hassan, Senator Murkowski, Congressman Mike Turner have been true partners in this endeavor, and I thank each and every one of them for their leadership and friendship. And thank you to President Biden, setting a great tone with his administration, who recognized the value in eliminating this barrier that does save lives. Thank you to Dr. Gupta. Thank you to Dr. Delphin Rittman and to Ann Milgram. Thank you for your commitment and your making a difference. This common sense step will vastly expand access to addiction treatment and will reduce stigma. And this would not have happened without each and every one of you in this room and well beyond. And while the legislative fight on MAT is over, the battle just begins to make treatment on demand a reality and to save lives, and that is still well underway. We need to inform everyone that this needs to be part of routine medical practice. We need to keep pushing, and I know that we've got the right group here to do just that. So thank you, all of you, for your dedication, for your hard work. The fight is not yet over, but this is a pivotal step forward. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce a soulful individual who knows what difference this is going to make, Dr. Alistair Martin, who is an emergency medical specialist, Massachusetts General Hospital. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Alistair Martin, and he is going to make a difference. Thank you so much, Representative Tonko. Um, I want to start by saying to you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Uh, your perseverance, your dedication, your commitment to this is why we are here today. Senator Hassan, thank you so much for your leadership, your collaborative spirit, 
and helping to get this over the finish line. It's the White House team for bringing us together. Thank you so, so, so much. I want to tell you uh, about how transformational this is for me as an emergency physician and for my emergency medicine brothers and sisters. But before we get there, I want to tell you a quick story of how I came to do this work. It's 2015, and I was uh, in the first week of my first year as a physician. And uh, I had hair back then, you can imagine that. Uh, and I was taking care of a young woman uh, on a Friday night, 2 a.m., who was in her early 20s. She was a mother of two. And she had fallen down the stairs at her son's daycare about eight weeks before seeing me in the ER. She had a bad ankle fracture, and she had to have a massive surgery to fix it, an open reduction in internal fixation. She was started on oxycodone at another hospital, and over the course of the proceeding of the subsequent uh, weeks, six to eight weeks, she found that she could not feel normal without this medication. She started taking medication from her kitchen cabinet and cupboards. Her uh, husband had had an injury recently. She then started stealing medication from her friends and family. She went so far as to get a dealer from the town that she grew up in. She decided that night that she did not want to live this life. She wanted to get better. She started looking around and searching for options, for addiction treatment specialists, for addiction treatment centers, and she could not get in. There were no options available. So she presented to the emergency department, and she asked me a question I'll never forget. She said, Doctor, can you help me? Of course, I said. You came to the right place. We'll absolutely take care of you. Don't worry about it. For those of you who know how academic medical centers work, the residents come up with the plans and the attendings approve them and sort of edit them and put them into place. So I walked over to my attending and I said, you know, we've got this woman. Let's help her get access to treatment. Let's get her her life back. I want to admit her and get her an addiction counsel. And he said to me, this is a kind, compassionate, intelligent ER physician. He said, Alistair, that's just not what we do here. Discharge her. That walk back from his desk to her room is one of the longest walks I've ever taken in my entire life. I looked her in the eye and told her, we cannot help you. And in fact, here are your, your discharge papers. I could not help her that night because I didn't have a DAX waiver. Neither did my attending physician. And that uh, triggered us to uh, launch the Get Wavered campaign at our hospital. We started with one out of 50 physicians who had their DAX waivers. We ended with 46 out of 50. We then took the show on the road and worked with hospitals across the country to get over 5,000 clinicians the training they needed to get their DEAX waivers. Uh, we also created these badges that make it easier for emergency physicians to treat the patient in the, in the hospital when patients are presenting. But think about the numbers for a second. We helped about 5,000 folks where the majority of those folks were ER physicians or ER NPs or PAs. There are over 50,000 ER physicians alone in this country. We were just scratching at the surface. If the opiate addiction epidemic was a fire, we were walking around with an eyedropper trying to put it out. With the stroke of the pen, President Biden overnight has transformed our nation's ability to treat addiction in the ER. He has effectively converted the ER into the front door for addiction recovery treatment. Now, I don't know what happened to the patient that I took care of that night. I hope she got better. I hope she got the treatment she needed. I think about her a lot. What I do know is that if she were to come into an ER today in one of our nation's emergency rooms, because of this bill and because of what has happened here today, she will get access to the treatment that she needs and a much, much, much more likely, uh, she's much more likely to start her uh, road to recovery. I want to thank you to the advocates, to the uh, uh, representatives, the senators who made today possible, and to President Biden for uh, following through on his commitment to making access to addiction treatment uh, easier for patients in this country. And now it is my pleasure to uh, introduce to you my new friend, uh, Shannon Hicks. Well, that's uh tough thing to follow, everybody, and um, I would like to first thank everybody who's worked so hard and President Biden for keeping his promise of removing the X waiver for buprenorphine prescribing. 
this is a huge first step for Americans who struggle with opiate use disorder. I would like to also thank my friend, Dave Didden, all the doctors who helped deal with me during my chaotic substance use and recovery, as well as my friends, family, and especially my husband and daughters. Uh, I'd like to start with a brief background about myself before I talk about why the removal of the X waiver is so awesome for those of us helping people with opiate use disorders. Like so many others who have endured childhood trauma, I began to self-medicate at a very early age. I became pregnant a month after my 16th birthday, and by the time I had turned 19, I had two young children, a husband, and had bought my first home. Thought I was living the dream. Shortly after the birth of my second daughter, my oldest daughter was diagnosed with a rare and debilitating bone disorder, mccune wright syndrome, very similar to OI, or brittle bone disease. She's now 25 years old and has had over 25 surgeries to put plates and rods in her bones. And last night, as she got out of my vehicle, I think she may have fractured her knee, but we'll figure that out eventually. So unlike most people who struggled with opiate use disorder, I've been on both sides of the fence, dealing with the issue of needing and obtaining opiates long-term as my daughter's medical condition warrants, and then the addiction side of opiates where I work the system to supplement my opiate addiction. Fast forward to 2016. By this point, I had spent the better part of the previous two decades struggling with my substance use disorder. And after many failed attempts at abstinence-based recovery, I eventually accepted the idea that I was constitutionally incapable of ever getting sober. I was doomed to die a worthless, heroin-addicted, unredeemable druggie, and my family would be better off once I was dead. By this time, I had suffered numerous pulmonary embolisms due to injecting the tamper-proof variations of certain prescription opiates, and had one aortic valve replacement under my belt as a direct result of my IV drug use. But somehow, I was still managing to keep up an outward appearance that I was not using drugs. This changed when on January 28, 2016, I was admitted into Fairfax Hospital for the fight of my life. I had always known never to share needles. However, I was unaware how reusing the same needle over and over could almost kill me. I had infected my mechanical aortic valve with MRSA. This time there was no denying I was addicted. The doctors told my husband he needed to prepare himself and he needed to prepare our daughters. That they would do what they could, but the MRSA had digested over half of my heart and it was very unlikely I would survive the surgery. Thankfully, I did. Still in the hospital a few weeks later, I was told I was being tapered off the last of my pain medications and I was going to be placed on buprenorphine. I was not happy at all. I actually threw quite a large fit and told the doctor that there was no way I was going on buprenorphine. I was not going to substitute one addiction for another. And the doctor told me, Shannon, you almost died. If you want any chance of surviving and being a mother to your daughters, you will take the medication. I finally agreed. And when I asked how long I needed to be on the medication, the doctor told me, with a history like yours, we recommend three to five years. But if it were up to me, I would keep you on it for life. I quietly scoffed at that idea and started plotting ways to taper myself off within the next three to six months. However, my plan quickly changed as I began to realize buprenorphine was not what I had been led to believe it was, and it most definitely was not a substitution for heroin. This medication calmed the ever-present anxiety and cravings I had experienced during every other time I attempted recovery. This medication allowed me the ability to finally be able to learn the skills that would help me get through the hard times in my life. It got rid of the forever present desire to get high that had always accompanied my attempts at abstinence-based recovery. Medication-assisted recovery, recovery allowed me the chance to rebuild my life, repair damaged relationships, 
and be the mother to my daughters that they needed and deserved. Once these things became clear to me, I made it my mission to help dispel the myths regarding medication-assisted treatment and spread the word that there are many pathways to recovery, not just abstinence alone. And being on medication-assisted recovery does not mean you are not sober. It means you value your life and the life of your loved ones enough that you have given yourself the best possible chance to obtain long-term recovery. Being active in harm reduction, I saw how the restrictions of the X waiver directly impacted those who were using opiates and wanted to get help. They just couldn't find it. The lifting of this waiver has opened the door to so many of those struggling with opiate use disorders. No longer will patients be turned away from doctor's offices for hitting the limit for new patients. No longer will those looking for recovery be forced to drive for hours to try to find a doctor who can prescribe buprenorphine. No longer will those desperate for recovery have such limited options. This is giving those who want to st stop chaotically using opiates an opportunity they never previously had. However, we are still faced with one problem, and it's a big one. The elimination of the X waiver means absolutely nothing if doctors are unwilling to prescribe these life-saving medications or if pharmacies refuse to carry or even fill these type of prescriptions for fear of being flagged by the DEA. We need a paradigm shift in the way the DEA works with prescribers and pharmacies regarding medications for opiate use disorders. Currently, less than half of all U.S. pharmacies carry any type of buprenorphine naloxone combination medication. And try to find a pharmacy that carries the buprenorphine alone, that's almost impossible. This is after, this is after several studies have shown that the buprenorphine only formula is not misused more than the buprenorphine naloxone formula and has certain benefits over the combination formula, such as it's easier to transition onto when a patient is starting treatment, especially when it pertains to fentanyl. Some pharmacies refuse to take new patients who are prescribed these life-saving medications. Some pharmacies will not stock these medications. Pharmacists could be a huge partner in helping our community members that are struggling with opiate use disorders, but fear of possible negative repercussions prevents many from being part of the solution. We need to work on finding a solution that allows doctors who have years of medical training and experience to prescribe how they see fit to their patients. No doctor should be looking over their shoulder worried that by doing what is best for their patient, this could make them vulnerable to an investigation. There are bad apples everywhere. And yes, some doctors pushed opiates without discretion back in the day. And thankfully, a lot of these doctors were brought to justice thanks to the hard work of DEA. But many honorable doctors, like my daughter's doctor and my doctor, are constantly justifying their prescribing practices to ensure their patients get the medications they need and deserve that allow them to become productive members of society. And unfortunately, these doctors are becoming few and far between. Doctors are weary and tired, and many have decided it isn't worth the hassle prescribing these medications can cause. We need to help reassure them that they can be part of this solution too. There is no question we are moving in the right direction, and the removal of the X waiver is a great accomplishment, but it is just the first step of many that are needed if we are going to save lives of our citizens who are struggling with opiate use disorders. No one in the greatest country on earth should have to die because they use drugs. Let's start judging people by their character, not the number of prescriptions filled, written, or that may or may not be in their bloodstream. And with that, I'll hand the floor back to Dr. Gupta. Thank you.
Thank you, Shannon, for that, uh, the important grounding um, story of your life and your daughter's life. And you're here because you found the physician who's willing to provide you the treatment and not succumb to the stigma the, uh, we often face. So many of us in the medical profession, it's just no different than, you know, across America. So thank you all for being here today and, and making this particular recognition possible. Um, this is a celebration of how far we have come, but we all know that our mission must continue, must continue. While we work to reduce the supply of drugs entering our country and our communities, we still need to do more to expand treatment. And we need to do more to address these, what we call structural determinants of health, things like housing and transportation, childcare, food security, and others. But we also need to prevent substance use before it begins. And we've got to support people in recovery from substance use disorder, people like Shannon. Thank you, Shannon, again, for sharing your story today. The bottom line is this, folks, that we have tens of thousands of lives to save, one potentially every five minutes. So I look forward, we all here look forward to working with folks across the nation. Uh, thanks for joining us here and online. Uh, for the folks here, we, I understand we do have some cupcakes and coffee <laughs> outside, which you're welcome to please enjoy and come back here and enjoy. Thank you so much. Thank you.